for the next session, we will welcome a new guy, a new guy in the world of the mental preparation because he published almost 300 publications, six books, and 80 articles, so yes, maybe she's not so younger, but uh, with maybe a little experience, he will talk with you together about 30 years of experience as an Olympian psychologist. We don't have the video, but we have a picture and the sound, so please welcome to Peter Terry. He's Dean of the Graduate Research School Professor of Psychology at the University of Southern Queensland. Peter, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah, perfect. Welcome. We can applaud, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, um, bonjour. If you can hear uh, us, it's your time. Bonsoir in Australia. Perfect, thank <laughs> it's, you. Uh, it's evening here, but uh, lovely to be there. So, shall I start? I have, okay. Um, I'd first of all like to talk about how uh, It should be on the next slide here, I think. Um, can you? OK, there we go. Um, Perfect. I'd like to talk about how uh, I, as a psychologist, in, have interacted with um, athletes and coaches um, over the years. There's many different ways to, uh, to do it, and um, here are some examples. So, for example, some psychologists, I believe, uh, come in and they hand down the truth uh, as though it's uh, from Mount Sinai handing down the truth to coaches and athletes. Of course, this is not the way to do it. <laughs> and I think that very quickly coaches and athletes um, uh, turn off this approach. Another approach is sometimes where perhaps a coach does not trust the sports psychologist and would rather work, the psychologist work through the coach rather than working directly with the athlete. And this was perhaps a more protective approach uh, in, in past eras. Um, and, and of course, that doesn't work either. Uh, this is a, a more effective model where the coach, athlete and sports psychologists uh, work uh, in harmoniously as a uh, respecting one another's expertise. Uh, uh, you know, most psychologists realize, and all of them should realize, that the coach and the athlete are the experts in the sport, um, and the psychologist is there to support their efforts. But for me, the best model. Oh, it's not there. Um, I've lost a slide. Okay, I'll describe it to you. Um, is what I call the complete picture, where the psychologist is embedded within the, um, the national governing body, as it were, uh, as part of the team, um, working with the other support professionals so that everything that is delivered for the benefit of the coach and the athlete um, takes into consideration um, what everybody else is doing. And uh, that uh, integration, I think, is really important and something I've learned over the years. Um, as, a, as a support member, you can be on the periphery. You can uh, be having input maybe, you know, once a month. And from, to my mind, that's not a very effective model. Um, you can be a full, fully fledged member of the team, um, which is obviously better. But it, in my experience, a psychologist needs to become part of what I've called the inner sanctum, um, where, where the real dis, um, detailed discussions of strategy um, and the planning for for road trips, for for particularly as for something as big as the Olympic Games, that the, the sports psychologist should be involved at that very detailed level in the what I call the inner sanctum. Now, if we look at my own experiences, um, my my first Olympics was actually in France, the Winter Olympics in 1992 in Albertville, um, with the with the British bobsleigh team, and I was a team member but not really part of the 
in a sanctum, as it were. Um, whereas in the summer games, I was working with tennis, but on the periphery. So for me, for a sports psychologist to do their job to the optimum, they really need to be it part of that inner sanctum. And most of the, uh, the three Winter Olympics, six Summer Olympics, most of the time I have been part of that. But I actually have uh, have moved back to, uh, in my last games, moved back to the periphery. And, uh, and, and I, in my mind, had limited effectiveness because of that. So that's a consideration and something, as I said, that I've learnt over the years. If we look at... Um, you know, what do you need from a sports psychologist and how important is it? Well, there's a couple of quotes here that at the Olympic Games, everything is a performance issue. It's there's so many issues. You can't even list them. Um, there are things happening all day, every day that have the potential to upset performance. And therefore, a sports psychologist who has a, a wide range of expertise who can respond to all sorts of things, whatever throws is thrown up by circumstance, is a very useful resource. Um, and looking at this quote at the bottom, when athletes look back at their experience in the Olympic Games and ask what they would do differently at the next Games, but bear in mind most athletes only ever go to one Games, um, more sports psychology was one of the most frequently cited responses um, because the games are different. Um, you know, they're just different in so many ways. The historical importance, the multi sports, the environment where suddenly people who've been ignored for four years become front page news. Um, and it's very easy for athletes uh, to be thrown out of their equilibrium, to be upset, to and therefore often to underperform. So the preparation um, on the psychological perspective for me uh, is key. But of course, I'm biased. And um, now, what characteristics should a sports psychologist have? Well, I think to be multi-skilled, as I call it, to have a big bag of tricks, you need to have many things at your disposal in, in order to intervene or to assist in whatever circumstance is thrown up. Having said that, you need a light touch. By that, what I mean is don't overwhelm the people you're trying to help with too much information or with too many techniques. Have them in reserve, but use them sparingly. And for me, in my, if I look at my methods that I use, I have some methodological cornerstones, which I will talk about. But what I actually do with any individual is highly individualized. If I think that uh, a particular individual would not benefit from one of the things I have on offer, I won't do it. Um, but there are certain cornerstones that I always use, and I, I will explain those soon. Attention to detail is a key of elite sport. Coaches, athletes and psychologists need to have that mindset that we don't leave little things to chance. If we get all the little things um, prepared for, then the whole thing should be that much better. I also feel that as a psychologist, it's my duty to model the behaviours that I'm looking for in athletes, which means that I have to remain calm, in control and confident and I've often had athletes tell me that they drew some confidence and calmness from my own manner uh, when I was around them. Um, the next thing is that the focus is should generally be on the task outcome. That's essentially, despite what everybody might say, the main reason everyone's there is for performance, a successful performance. Um, but not at the expense of the health, the well-being, the mental health of the people involved. So you have to have this fine balance between, yes, we're focused on the task at hand, but we never lose sight that we're dealing with people 
who are under enormous stress and we must care for them as psychologists. Another thing that I regard as important is the continuity of support. Um, I, I don't come in and try to um, teach people things and then disappear. I want to be and I have been over the years a very integral member of the team over a long period. Now then that raises the questions, the things I've said above, of whether a sports psychologist should be a registered psychologist and therefore have uh, that range of skills uh, that a psychologist must have. And my view is it certainly helps. Um, I am a registered psychologist. It's no good when you're there saying, ah, oh, look, this is a bit outside my area of expertise. I need to refer you because um, you have to deal with it at the time. And I'm, what I'm finding more and more is that sports psychologists who are being selected for the Olympic Games are actually not only registered psychologists, but they're also clinical psychologists as well as sports psychologists. And people are now being trained in both of those disciplines uh, within a single degree. Um, so moving on. My starting point um, as, a, as a sports psychologist is that performance influences emotions. We know that and it can be both positive and negative. There are no greater emotional highs or lows in life, I don't think, than you see in sport, both for the people participating and the people watching. But equally, emotions are going to influence performance. And for every person, there is an optimal mindset that uh, we associate with their best performance. So therefore, understanding that process at the individual level is very important. So I developed um, many years ago a mood scale, which I use with all of my athletes. I have done since 1992. It's called the Brunel mood scale. It was validated using athletes. It has normative data for athletes, which we've just um, updated in 2021 based on a, a, a data set of about 16,000. It's very quick. Um, it's suitable for children as well as adults and it's free to use. Now, it's also been translated into many languages, including French, so it's available if you wish to use it. Over the years, we've identified six very distinct mood profiles. And some of them are quite well known. The green one you can see is known as the iceberg where vigor is high and the other uh, mood dimensions, tension, depression, anger, vigor, sorry, tension, depression, anger, fatigue and confusion are low. That is generally associated with good performance, but it's very common. Um, about 28% of the population report that. So it doesn't say anything particular about whether an individual athlete is going to perform well. However, if we look at the red one, where you have very high tension, depression, anger, confusion and fatigue and very low vigour, it doesn't take a genius to work out that that is likely to be associated not only with underperformance, but with often clinical mental health issues. That We call that the inverse Everest, and that is associated with the greatest risk of mental health issues, followed by the yellow one um, and, and so on. The blue one is an interesting one, the shark fin, as we call it, very low vigor, very high fatigue. I've, I see that as an accident or possibly an injury waiting to happen. Um, and if, in fact, um, as the, as the data shows, many athletes actually get injured at the Olympic Games and, and miss their event. So for me, monitoring people's moods is a very quick and simple way of getting an overview of how they're traveling, whether they're ready or whether there's still some work to be done. And when I'm work away with a team, it's really the only way I can check on everybody in a, in, in a, in a, on a regular basis. Um, and um, so 
the whole team does it, including the athlete, including the coaches and the support staff, would do it every two to three days. Now, here's some examples um, that shouldn't say mood profile clusters. This is about an athlete in the, um, uh, sorry, this, these are the first time I, I looked at this and found this useful. This was from the 1992 Winter and Summer Olympics. Having monitored a, a number of athletes, 42 who performed to expectations and 37 who underperformed, what we found was that both sets of athletes showed the iceberg profile, but for those who performed better, it was a more extreme, higher vigour and lower on the other, the more negative dimensions. And we could correctly classify 71% of them from their mood profile taken before performance to decide whether they would or would not perform well. So I thought to myself at that point, there's something in this. And so I've used it ever since. And, um, oops, sorry, excuse me. Um, let me say that mood profiling does not predict who will be a champion, right? But it does predict the quality of performances to a moderate degree. And anything that takes two minutes to do and can predict that is useful. And the, the evidence base for that we published that about 20 odd years ago. I'm going to look at my experience with bobsleigh, which lasted for 10 years. And I worked with them for up to 100 days a year and 100 days a year during Olympic years. I went to three Olympic Games with them and 32 World Cup or World Championship events. Coming back to that point I made about the complete picture I was actually a member of the board of directors of that organization, which meant I was I was involved with the main decision making, including the funding of things and so on. So I was in at the heart of that sport and my approach was individualized, but with common elements. And the elements that I used with those, this is a team sport where most of the people involved have come from individual sports, typically track and field. So team dynamics is a very big issue in that sport. We've got people not used to being part of a team, not used to making some of the self-sacrifice that are necessary to be part of the team, coming into a team environment. Visualisation was key in that sport. And if you look at the photograph of the driver, he's, he's visualising the course. Now, I didn't have to teach him that because all bobsleigh drivers do it. But I helped him, I think, get more out of that visualisation process. Music is something that nearly all athletes love to listen to. And I help them use it in a way that may be more precise in terms of their preparation and maybe uh, more beneficial um, to their performance. You hear a lot about what ifs. We spend a lot of time talking about the things that could go wrong, the things that we will face. What if in bobsleigh is performed in a very harsh environment? Things break, parts of the sled break. Do we have a replacement? It was those sorts of that sort of detail. What if the truck breaks down and so on? Um, mood management is always in there and personal counselling is always in there and that Top photograph, by the way, is my introduction to the sport. My very first weekend, they asked me, what did I know about this sport? And I couldn't even say I'd seen the movie Cool Runnings because it hadn't been made at the time. So they put me in the team for this first weekend to see if I could walk the talk, as it were. So I passed the test and stayed for 10 years. This is a, the profiles of a medal winning athlete in the 1998 games. And what we took the measure about every three days. And what you can see there is that in the middle of that preparation, there's a spike in depression and there's a spike in anger. Um, and that was not discernible from this athlete's behavior. Um, so, but what it does do, it gives me 
insight into how they're feeling and allows me to explore why they're feeling that and what we can do about it. And in this instance, it was something to do with things from home. We were in Japan, things back in the UK, things were going wrong with the family and he could not do anything about it. So knowing that and being able to help at least deal with the emotions of it, sometimes you're trying to help with the uh, with a practical solution, even if it's just to uh, put things uh, on a on an even keel for just a short while. So for me, it was very important um, as an intervention to know what was going on. And then if you look at competition, competition day two, that light blue, that's when we really wanted the mood to be right. And you can see it was an iceberg with just slightly above average tension, which is not unusual in the Olympics. The music we used, if we look, looked at the record there, in Alberville they'd finished sixth, in Lillehammer they'd finished fifth, 1998 was going to be their moment. So this song, Whitney Houston's One Moment in Time, was the perfect way to encapsulize or to crystallize um, everything that we planned for. So we would play that song every day on the way to the to the bobsleigh event. And as they would all be singing it, as we went through the gates, Whitney would just be finishing the song and it stayed with them the whole day we were there. They would, they would sing that. And look, was it to do with the music that we won a medal? No, but did it help? Yes. In fact, we shared the medal with France. Um, and um, I still have one of those, uh, French Olympic ski jackets that I wear occasionally. If we look at the evidence base for music, by the way, it's very strong. I published a paper last year where we summarized 130 studies um, looking at, um, at the effects of music. And we found that not only does it have a, a beneficial effect on our feelings, but it actually has a small effect on physical performance. Uh, there are a few ifs and buts. It reduces perceived exertion and it can even actually reduce oxygen consumption for exactly the same amount of work by about one to two percent. So there's a lot of benefits to be had from music. And if you don't believe me, listen to Michael Phelps because that's his uh, his big thing when he's competing. He listens to hip hop and rap and, uh, you know, when he came back from Beijing after winning eight gold medals, one of the first things he did was go to speak to Lil Wayne, who was the singer of the song that um, meant the most to him there. So I'll move on to a, a next uh, case study. Um, I, I was involved in marathon kayak with this particular person. She's given me permission to talk about this for 17 years. The majority of the time after I moved to Australia, so we did it generally by distance. Um, I was mainly focused just on her, and mostly I didn't get paid for it. I'm not recommending that, but sometimes that's the way it is. Again, the individualized approach with common elements. In her case, a lot of it was about self image um, and her personal wellness. She was prone to working too hard, overtraining, getting burnt out, and so on. In her sport, the race plan is absolutely key um, and we spend a lot of time developing the race plan with her coach and then her visualizing that race plan till she it was absolutely second nature and she planted the images in her head of what she wanted to happen and you know she was five times world champion but she suffered from chronic fatigue syndrome for two years and she was advised actually to retire. Um, but she used reverse therapy. I didn't teach that to her, but it, it was the way she overcame her chronic fatigue syndrome and she regained two world titles. Now that photograph on the bottom there on the left is her with her um, MP3 sunglasses. So she could listen to music on the, uh, on the water. This was her song the recovery, I'm like a bird. Maybe you could sing that to yourself. But he was learning to fly again as she rehabilitated. In fact, the, the rhythm and the tempo of that song was is actually quite slow. And that was the purpose to slow her down during training. 
because she had a tendency to, to put too much into training and cause a problem for herself. So it was more about feeling free, uh, flying, being relaxed and so on. Very important while she was recovering. When she got back into, into the World Championship, the song World's Greatest um, obviously fits the scenario and she only ever played that before the World Championships. And in fact, what we see here in those photographs is she her race plan was to win the race on the last portage where they have to run 500 meters with their kayak. She came into the portage in third place behind the Hungarian and the, and the Danish girl. She went back in the water 100 meters ahead of them. And it was all about visualizing that particular part of the race. And essentially the, ch the chasing pair gave up and she, she paddled to an easy victory. And the song, that world, world's greatest was really an important part of her getting in that really, really confident mindset. Um, her profiles here, we see this very negative profile that was actually two years post competition when she was overtrained. And it was very useful to see her emotional recovery over that two year period and coming in to the games where on race day you see the green one, uh, the light green one is, is very much the iceberg profile we'd have been looking for. And it was very helpful to be able to monitor her emotional recovery and then the build up to the games. A look at very quickly case study three. I had a 15 year involvement in shooting, working for many different national teams of Great Britain, Brunei, Ireland, India, Singapore, Malaysia, and indeed Australia, over four Olympic Games. And the same thing, the same approach there, um, the self-image is important. The competition routines, particularly during the round, in between the shots, after a mistake, and so on, these are critical in that sport. We would use neurofeedback training. I see I'm running out of time, so I'll just move on to that. Um, this was an Olympic champion in 2000. Um, we would, the self image for him was the Iceman and we built the Iceman over a couple of years. The, the blue dot should be in the middle of the watch. That blue dot represented the Iceman. No emotion, no thoughts, just nothingness really. And that every time he looked at his watch, we look at our watch about 40 times a day, he would see the blue dot and think Iceman. Um, and we also went to train with the existing world champion in the preparation for the games. Russell Mark won the gold in Atlanta. Richard Folds went to train with him in, in Melbourne. And you see that, that quote, from Russell. It's very hard to soar with eagles if you're knocking around with turkeys. And this notion of getting to getting the best people in the world to train together, even though they're going to become opponents once the game starts, is a very important principle. And in fact, the way it worked out is that Richard bottom left, Richard won gold, Russell won silver. So it worked for everybody. This was the neurofeedback that we would use to condition um, the, the optimal brain activity. So we would identify the EEG activity associated with best shots, and that would be done on the shooting range. And then we would use neurofeedback training to train that optimal EEG activity off the range by playing video games with brain waves. It's quite a sophisticated approach. It's used a lot in shooting. Um, and after about 30 or 40 sessions of about 20 minutes, um, you can call up that EG activity more or less at will. And we would build an association between doing that and a specific piece of music, which then you would use the music on competition day to generate the desired activity the desired EEG activity. 
Now, what happens, this is a very sad photograph for me, when the dream is over, he underperformed in the, in the Olympics. That's when the mood profiling came into play afterwards. There was dramatic emotional turmoil, a depression episode. You can see that on the left-hand side. And we would monitor as we went through. He was back home in, in Ireland. I was back home in Australia, but we we do this online and you we could just see the emotional recovery. Very important after the event if someone's underperformed. I'll, I'll skip through these just to say that mood profiling is used in a lot of other uh, um, types of environments outside of sport. It's a great catalyst for discussion, a mood profile. My, you can get access to my research at those places. And I, the mood profiling system is free. You can use it online at moodprofiling.com. Uh, about 30,000 users at the moment. Um, it it get, gives you the profile. It tells you whether you're green as a traffic light or not. If it's not, it gives you some suggestions for the sorts of things you can do. Um, in order to um, modify, regulate your mood. There's also a book that you can access for free, Secrets of Asian Sports Psychology, 20 odd chapters, for specific sports in countries that excel. Um, and um, archery in Korea, diving in China, rowing in Australia, rugby in New Zealand, and so on. There's a free online course which is actually being redeveloped, not available at the moment, um, with a few different modules. You get a certificate of achievement. There have been uh, 23,000 users of that and about 550 there from France. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. My son, Dominic, was in Paris two weeks ago. I wish I could have been with him. Um, and he's giving himself a tattoo in front of the Eiffel Tower. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, Terry. Very um, much, Terry. Is, there is there any questions? OK. Uh, yes, Anel, maybe. Yes. It's coming, P Peter, if you can hear us. There is one question. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. And my question is about uh, the music. How can you evaluate the impact of uh, the different music on the, on the mood and also on the performance of uh, your athlete? Okay, um, it's a good question. The fact is I don't really evaluate it when I'm working with an individual athlete. I mean, of course, I say, you know, did the music help? Is that the right music? Should we change it? Um, but the, the evidence comes from usually from uh, experiments done in a laboratory where people perform certain things with and without music um, and different types of music. And that's where the evidence base comes from. We know that that music is a very powerful uh, moderator of both our perceived exertion. We think we're working less hard when we work in time to music and our emotions, of course but it does affect our physiology, it does affect performance. Now, whether that carries over into an Olympic environment, I don't know, but I use the same principles from the experimental evidence to try to get a little more out of the performance of an Olympic athlete. And we, we talk about it afterwards, did it help? They go, no, I don't, I don't like that song. I don't like music, it doesn't help me. Okay, we don't do it again. Um, but we, we find, sometimes we find things, and it's just the final piece of the jigsaw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Maybe 30 years of experience uh, as a uh, psychological Olympic, maybe three more years and we will see in Paris, 2024. <laughs> yes, well, actually, I don't get invited to the Olympics <laughs> anymore. Maybe. I tend to work from the distance. But if I could be there, I'd love to be there. And of course, come pleasure. to Brisbane in 2032. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>